Welcome, everybody. What a night and what a week in American politics and really what a month it has been one month ago. How different did this presidential race look? And it is incredible what we have seen in the last four to five weeks culminating last night on the fourth of four nights at the Democratic National Convention with Kamala Harris, the current vice president, accepting the nomination to represent the Democratic Party uh, on the presidential ticket in November. This happened in Chicago and it was quite a moment on behalf of my mother and everyone who has ever set out on their own unlikely journey on behalf of Americans like the people I grew up with, people who work hard, chase their dreams and look out for one another. On behalf of everyone whose story could only be written in the greatest nation on earth, I accept your nomination. What was excellent about Kamala Harris's speech, aside from the fact that at 40 minutes, it felt like just the right duration, long enough to lay out not only her positive vision for the country, but also to remind the audience what the alternative is. And it's pretty weird and it's pretty authoritarian and it's pretty disgusting. The duration was not too long and not too short and uh, delivered in an excellent, excellent uh, tone without condescending, without being nasty, for lack of a better term. And it's not a term I normally use. Trump uses it all the time. I think it actually applies here without being nasty with regard to how it might come off to people who already support you versus those who don't, because at the end of the day, the people in the room like Gavin Newsom here and Nancy Pelosi clapping, they already support Kamala Harris. The question is, what did it do to those who were maybe ambivalent or unsure? Kamala Harris laid out she will not cozy up to the tyrants and dictators, drawing a distinction between her outlook on global affairs and Donald Trump's, who is increasingly enamored with these authoritarian dictators. to defend our forces and our interests against Iran and Iran backed terrorists. I will not cozy up to tyrants and dictators like Kim Jong Un who are rooting for Trump, who are rooting for Trump. Because, you know, they know they know he is easy to manipulate with flattery and favors. They know Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. And as president, I will never waver in defense of America's security and ideals because in the enduring struggle between democracy and tyranny, I know where I stand and I know where the United States belongs. What's brilliant about that little segment is that it's a criticism of Trump, a serious one, an important one based along one of the most, you know, the, are we friends with Western democracies or are we friends with dictators to the extent you can even be friends with dictators rather than they just are using you and you don't even notice it. She, she outlines that, but she also explains her view and the vision that she has and it's one that is delivered clearly and succinctly and very hard to get too angry with. Now, Trump did get angry with it. We'll get to that later. The other aspect of the speech that I think was very good uh, was that she spoke directly to the people whose political views may vary. And she said, and it's a line that's been used before. I would be the president for everybody, whether you vote for me or not. But the context and the framing and the language and the delivery, it, it just all kind of worked. And let me say, I know there are people of various political views watching tonight. And I want you to know, I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put. Country 
country above party and self, to hold sacred America's fundamental principles from the rule of law to free and fair elections to the peaceful transfer of power. And that's another great example of here are the values I believe in. Here are the principles I believe in. And by mentioning one of the principles she believes in to be the peaceful transfer of power, it's an implicit criticism of the other side. It's an implicit criticism of what Donald Trump did and tried to do after the January after the 2020 election and in January of 2021. Really well done. And the, the writing was very good. But Kamala Harris has also improved significantly as a public speaker. And it all came together in a way that based on the focus groups we saw done afterwards was effective. And we'll get to that in a moment. There was also no shortage of more direct criticism of what the MAGA Republican Trumpist right is currently offering. And Kamala Harris did not mince words. She said they're crazy. They're out of their mind. Forced to carry a pregnancy to term. This is what's happening in our country because of Donald Trump. And understand he is not done. As a part of his agenda, he and his allies would limit access to birth control, ban medication abortion, and enact a nationwide abortion ban with or without Congress. And get this, get this, he plans to create a national anti-abortion coordinator and force states to report on women's miscarriages and abortions. Simply put, they are out of their minds. And one must ask, one must ask, why exactly is it that they don't trust women? Well, we trust women. So listen, my take overall is excellent speech, probably Kamala Harris's best speech. Is she at the level right now of Michelle Obama in terms of the ability to craft the narrative and the highs and the lows of the speech and the arc? No, but OK, it's still very good. Is this what Barack Obama was able to do earlier this week? No, but that, who cares? Right. The point is, is it good enough to convey the alternative that is facing voters in November. I believe that it was. And I'll say more about that. Here is Kamala Harris wrapping up the speech last night and wrapping up the convention with this. So let's get out there. Let's fight for it. Let's get out there. Let's vote for it. And together, let us write the next great chapter in the most extraordinary story ever told. Thank you. God bless you and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you all. All right. The ratings much better than for the RNC for the entire week. We know that Republicans and Trump are worried about that. But most importantly, we all are voting for her, right? I'm not sitting here going, well, let's see. She wants to raise the child tax credit. On the other hand, Trump would create mass deportation camps. Uh, I don't know. I'm undecided. That's not me. That's not any of us. I don't think there's a real question, though, as to what about the undecided voters? Anecdotally, Here's a focus group that CNN did immediately after the speech uh, with undecided Pennsylvania voters. And what you will see is that I believe it's seven of the eight made a decision at, on the basis of the speech. And six of the eight said, I'm going from undecided to now voting for Kamala Harris. About that. But what I want to ask all of you all together at this point, like I said, none of you were ready to make a commitment to any candidate in November. Please raise your hand right now if you're now ready to make a commitment after today. 
So seven wow. hands go up. I'm just kind of surprised, Bob. We, we haven't rehearsed this. I'm going to make that very clear. I will attest to this. Seven of you are now ready. Scott? Yes, I'm, I'm going to vote for Kamala Harris. Andy? Yeah, Kamala Harris, yes. Donna? Yes, I voted for her also. Sean? Um, Sean? Yes, uh, Kamala. Sabrina? Kamala. Patrick? Kamala. Brian? Trump. Trump. And finally, Lindsay. Still probably not voting. <laughs> Still probably you don't like either of them. Nope. OK, so uh, not <laughs> not voting after what we have seen as the dramatically different choices. Let's not even get into that. But anecdotally, Pennsylvania, eight voters who went into Kamala Harris's speech undecided, 75 percent of them, six out of eight, came out saying, based on the speech, I have changed my status from undecided to voting for Kamala Harris. Everything is pointing in the right direction. When we went into these con this convention, Kamala Harris was leading on average nationally by 1.4. Let's wait 10 days and see where the numbers land. We know one guy who did not like Kamala Harris's speech. I want to talk about that next. Failed former President Donald Trump suffered a terminal meltdown as Kamala Harris accepted the nomination on the fourth and final night of the Democratic National Convention last night. He seemed completely triggered and flailing, desperate, desperate to try to diffuse the energy that Kamala Harris brought yesterday. I'm not going to show you everything Trump published to Truth Social as Kamala Harris was speaking because it would take up the entire show. Truth Central. But he did post a number of troths and they were all really flaccid criticisms. As Kamala Harris spoke, Donald Trump posting too many thank yous too rapidly said what's going on with her. Apropos of nothing in all capital letters, Trump asking as Kamala Harris delivered her speech, where's Hunter? As Kamala Harris delivered her speech, Trump posting. Walls was an assistant coach, not a coach. Well, that's going to change who I'm voting for. That's for sure. Uh, Trump continuing, quote, why didn't she do something about the things of which she complains? This is one that Republicans have really attached themselves to. She tells us all these things she's going to do, but she's been the vice president for years. She could have done them well. Vice presidents don't set policy as the president. She would. It's not the craziest thing to understand. Trump then posting the chaos and calamity is allowing our country to be infiltrated by millions of criminals. Uh, shortly after Kamala Harris alluded to the January 6th riots, Trump posting in all capital letters peacefully and patriotically a reference to his claim that he never encouraged violence on January 6th. Trump then posting. And remember, this is all a, <clears throat> a live commentary on Kamala Harris's DNC speech. Quote, these prosecutions were all started by her and Biden against their political opponent. Me. There is no evidence whatsoever that Kamala Harris nor Joe Biden had any involvement in the indictments against Trump. I did everything right and they indicted me. Yeah. Then Trump in all capital letters asking, is she talking about me? And then Trump wrongly stating what Kamala Harris said by saying she just called to give all illegal citizenship, say goodbye to the USA. She is a radical Marxist. Of course, what Kamala Harris uh, talked about was a path to citizenship for those uh, that we know of as DACA recipients, individuals who came here before they were 18. And then finally, immediately after the speech, Donald Trump called into Fox and Friends and ranted so outrageously that Fox hosts Brett Bayer and Martha McCallum, they keep trying to end the interview and Trump just steamrolls them. Joe Biden in a Democrat primary. I right. have no doubt about it. And they made it absolutely impossible for him. They made it that you have yeah. to get 60, 70 percent of the vote just to yeah. get in. And you Mr. know what? President. In the end, the Democrats did the same thing to Joe Biden. They threw Joe Biden out of the yeah. party. And that's they why did we the saw same a different thing as they did to Mr. President, President, thank, thank you, you so very much, much sir. for the time. Okay, we appreciate that much. live feedback. <laughs> Stay right <laughs> there. Your live edition of Gutfeld is coming up. Thank you. So All right. Trump shot out of a cannon. Absolutely terminal meltdown. 
And if you think his reaction to Kamala's speech was nuts, just wait until you see the publicity stunt he tried to pull earlier in the day. Donald Trump, desperate for relevance, obsessed with getting some attention away from Kamala Harris's DNC speech, suffered an acute bout of confusion at a ridiculous event held at the Arizona border with Mexico. Confusion after confusion and Donald Trump seemingly accidentally endorsing Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom. Trump, in his desperation to attack everything and everyone, said the following about San Francisco. California, you can't go into San Francisco. It's not livable. 15 years ago it was the best city in the country, one of the best cities in the world. And now you can't do anything. Look at what she's done. And now she's going to be president and she's going to do the exact same thing. Trump saying that 15 years ago, San Francisco was the best city in the country and one of the best cities in the world. It's unfortunate politically for Trump that the mayor of San Francisco 15 years ago was Gavin Newsom and the district attorney of San Francisco 15 years ago was none other than Kamala Harris when Trump acknowledges it was the best city in the United States. More confusion for Trump asked why he didn't support the bipartisan border security bill. Trump says, well, when I was president, I closed the border. He never actually did that. But of course, he's confused about the fact that if what he really cared about was the border, he wouldn't have told Republicans kill the border bill. If they wanted to close the border, you know, I didn't have a bill. I said, close the border. I said, Brandon, close that border, Brandon. And what happened? He closed the border. They all did. Paul, the whole group of them, this group is incredible. They closed the border. I looked at him. I said, we don't have a bill. We don't need a bill. Close the damn border. They closed the border. Uh, none of that happened. And Trump's confusion palpable throughout this harebrained event on the Mexico border uh, in Arizona. Trump wrongly stating again that he should have won Minnesota twice, but only because of fraud did he not win. As I'm sure most of you know, Minnesota, a very blue state that Trump had no chance of winning. His numbers are horrible. People are fleeing his state. I love his state. We should have won his state twice, but a lot of hanky panky goes on there. Hasn't been one since 1972. Richard Nixon was the last one to win it. But every time I go in there, we have massive crowds and everything's good, but nobody seems to be able to win it. So I know why we didn't win it. People don't like to talk about it. Of course, Trump acknowledging that Republicans haven't won Minnesota in 50 years should be a sign that you didn't lose because of hanky panky. You lost because there's a lot more Democrats in Minnesota. Any event with Trump that relates to immigration or the border has to include these uh, totally free of context, lurid stories. And Trump did do that. Or he wrapped his arms around her throat, pinned her down on a park bench and raped her publicly on a park bench. And she said he wasn't trying to rape me. He was trying to kill me. In Michigan earlier this year, an illegal alien broke into a residence and sexually assaulted two young girls doing tremendous damage to these two young, beautiful girls in Virginia. So as you can tell, Trump uh, struggling to read, but the lurid stories, a mainstay of any immigration related discussion. And then finally, as is now normal, Fox News cutting coverage of Trump's speech because it just gets too ridiculous Down or under. The final gaps of the wall were about to be sealed. Then Kamala came Warren, in. We are monitoring Donald Trump. He is at a, a border community uh, just uh, along the Arizona Mexico border. Yes, and monitor very, very closely, Neil Cavuto. Thank you very much. A ridiculous event. Trump painfully confused. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this next thing, but a bunch of you sent it to me and I did find it interesting. After Trump's event at the U.S. Mexico border yesterday, during which he seemed to accidentally endorse Kamala Harris, he was interviewed by News Nation's Ali Bradley. And I don't know if it's because Trump is now afraid of standing outdoors after the failed assassination attempt or because he just didn't want to answer any questions. But Trump cut an interview with Ali Bradley short stating that it's dangerous out there. It's dangerous for him to stand out there in this area. Obviously, an assassin yeah. tried to kill you. Yeah, the, the you know sheriff's what? Can right I tell now? you something? Sure. We're in danger standing here talking. So let's not talk any longer. No, I know about it. 
But they don't want me standing here. They don't want you standing here either. Have a good time. Thank you very much. (laughs) And then Trump just walking away. So listen, if it is, we've gotten reports that Trump is watching the failed assassination attempt uh, against him over and over again on video and that he has PTSD. That's reasonable to me. That makes sense. I would probably be in the exact same situation. And if what's going on here is that Donald Trump is just afraid and he's just really paranoid about standing outdoors for any extended period of time, I actually would understand that. Of course, the question is, does he not really want to answer any questions from Ali Bradley from News Nation? And is that why he cut the interview early? Uh, We just don't know because Trump then lumbered off into his SUV and off they went. Just sort of a curious moment at the tail end here of Donald Trump's failed event at the U.S. Mexico border and uh, make of it what you will. Let me know what you think, but certainly an unusual moment. I have to show you J.D. Vance failing to make small talk and running a clinic on making people uncomfortable. This is one of the most cringy videos I've seen in a long time. The completely uncharismatic J.D. Vance went to a donut shop yesterday to buy donuts. He struggled to buy donuts. It was very complicated for him. And he starts talking to employees. One of the employees at the donut shop says, I don't want to be in this video. So they end up blurring her out. The other guy he talks to seems very displeased. I am almost having uh, uh, like a physical pain in watching how cringeworthy this is. And J.D. kind of like interviewing. It's almost like a conversation with H.R. the way he starts talking to them about their jobs. Look at this. Uh, the zoo has come to town. Thank you for letting us come in here. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, She doesn't want to be on film, guys, so just cut her out of anything. OK, so this first employee is blurred because she's like, do not film me. OK, it just gets worse from here. That's the best. I'm J.D. Vance. I'm running for vice president. Good to see you. OK, could you please stop filming, buy what you want and get out of here? You're, you're running for what? OK, c- did you did you want the donuts or not? It is difficult to be less personable than this. Um, how are we working? I've been here since uh, the beginning of July. Okay. For this year. Okay, good. How about you, sir? Uh, uh, almost two years. Okay, good. Just everything. Yeah, it'll be a lot of glaze, tears, some sprinkle stuff, some of these cinnamon rolls, just whatever makes sense. You can tell he's really picking the donuts he likes because he plans to eat them, and this is not just a completely painfully staged and forced photo op. Let's around. About four years. About four years. OK. How long have you been here? Uh, a little over six months. Okay. Tell me um, these light bulbs. How long have these been here? Mm hmm. OK. And you're using gloves to serve the donuts. All right. Uh, J.D. Vance, if you're worried he wasn't able to get the donuts because he seemed so disoriented and confused, eventually, with the help of three donut shop employees, a full team of security and campaign staffers. J.D. Vance was finally able to get a dozen donuts and end this absolutely disastrous photo op. There is no personality here, nothing. And when we look at Tim Wall's favorability and we look at J.D. Vance's favorability, which is actually unfavorability, he's underwater and we say, wow, I wonder why that's going on. It's this sort of thing. The guy is just bizarre and lacks any kind of personal connection or ability to make a personal connection. You almost start to feel bad for him. But remember, he's imposing on the workers who are here just trying to get through another day. But thankfully, he was able to get the sprinkle stuff and a bunch of glazed and get out of there without any uh, further major incident. You've got to be regretting picking this guy if you're Donald Trump. Let's take a break on what has been uh, one of the most uh, uh, consequential, I would say, 24 hours in American politics of the last month. You are not going to want to miss Pete Buttigieg running another clinic on Fox News. Dozens of you sent me that video. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the David Pakman show. And we'll be right back. 
Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com. Joinpacman.com. The David Pakman show directly depends on your support. I encourage you to get the full David Pakman show experience by signing up at joinpacman.com. It'll take you about a minute with average technical skills. That's the way I kind of lay it out. You can use the coupon code DNC not weird this week only to save 60% off of the membership of your choice, including the single pay lifetime membership at joinpacman.com. Pete Buttigieg has done it again to Fox News. Uh, Pete Buttigieg appeared with Lawrence Jones on Fox News during the Democratic National Convention. The topic of crime came up and Pete Buttigieg did something which I love, which is not only was he able to resist and reject and redirect the failed talking points from the Fox host, he also said to the Fox audience, if you only watch this channel, you probably aren't even aware of what's going on. These people probably don't even tell you about the truth of what's happening with crime. So let's listen to Pete Buttigieg once again put on a clinic and how to deal with right wing media. And down to the debt uh, ceiling negotiations that she had to take it over because he didn't know the talking point. He for. won the debt ceiling negotiations. That's the point. You can go over whether he uh, slips up and says one name when he wants to say another name, or you can look at what he's actually accomplished as president. It turns out he's really good at being president of the United States. So let's talk about the record of the Biden Harris administration. When you look at inflation, it's up 19.4%. When you look at the Southern border is 8.1 encounters. When you look at crime, I just want to pause it here. See how there's the, this is the perfect example of a meaningless statistic of no consequence whatsoever. When you see up on a screen 8.1 million southwest border encounters, that doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you how many of them are encounters with people on this side of the border who are here legally, but it's just an encounter? How many are people seeking asylum? How many are uh, folks that are being taken into custody versus not? What you, how do these numbers compare? What do these numbers mean with it's just it's just a number and it doesn't mean anything. It's absent any context or meaning. Violent crime across 66 major cities is up almost 10 percent at 9.6 percent. Is that a record that you can run on? Well, certainly uh, the Biden Harris record of bringing crime down compared to why crime went up under Donald Trump. And I often wonder, you know, whether viewers of this network are aware that yes. violent crime went up under Donald Trump. I think that deserves more coverage so we can ask ourselves why. And some of that has to do with policy. But some of that has to do with the message we send when you have Donald Trump, an unrepentant convicted criminal mm -hmm. running against a prosecutor like Kamala Harris. We have an opportunity to send a message about whether we're serious on law and order in this country or whether it's a talking point or whether it's just something tr people try to. It's only a talking point. We figured that out for sure. Use as a political theme for partisan gain. Uh, you want to talk about inflation? Inflation went up in every country after COVID, but we brought inflation down in this country. Of course, the most important question, so, every election is about the future, yeah. right? And in the future, economists predict the Trump plan will increase costs for American families by $3,900. So why would we go back? I don't want somebody's to, gonna make it worse. I don't want you to think that the crime issue or inflation issue is something new because I've been covering it for years. I go out there and talk with voters every single day. So you did cover the Yesterday, increase in crime under Trump. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to talk with a mother. <laughs> She's not a Republican. She's someone that would vote for a Democrat most of the time. Many of the people that are complaining are actually Democrats. Yes, it's 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 primarily Democrats complaining. So Pete doing a really, really, really good job. And then when Lawrence Jones pulls the number of people shot out of a hat, 
Pete Buttigieg says, then shouldn't we be doing something about gun violence by electing the right people? Back to you, Mr. Secretary, the people that are being killed in places all over the country, they look like me, they don't look like you. And they're upset with the Democratic Party not taking it seriously. You guys sent the cavalry in. Not taking in. it seriously. Hold on, let me finish. You guys no, sent the cavalry Well, you guys sent the cavalry in for you guys for your protection. But the people of Chicago don't see that on a day to day basis. What are you guys going to do to stop the bloodshed in our community? Well, first of all, I was mayor of a city that faced that kind of pain. The toughest part of the job was dealing with gun violence, and the most heartbreaking part of the job was comforting or trying to comfort mothers who just wanted their their child back. And the big question, I think, for politics, for policy, for media, is who is going to help them versus who is going to use them? The questions she's asking are the exact question any citizen should be asking, which is when you take office, what do you mean are you going to are you keep your promises? Are you saying that mother is being used? I'm saying that mother is asking the exact right question. And the question is, what are you going to actually do when you come into office? Now, we're getting uh, no, a lot of people speaking up about- No, just tell me what you guys are going to do. About, just tell sure, me what you guys are- what, yeah, I'll tell you exactly what, what, what we're going to do. I'll tell to you. Stop I will tell you, actually confront gun violence. 90% of Americans, more than 80% of Republicans, think we ought to at least be doing universal background checks. But Donald Trump says no. The Republican Party says no. You talk about assault weapons, something that made a difference when that assault weapons ban contributed to the reduction in crime. I remember coming to Chicago as a kid. And by the way, even though some media only want to talk about the worst and most painful things that go on in our city, Chicago is a proud city. Chicago is an extraordinary city, but I do remember coming here when crime and murder was off the charts and the work that went on to bring it down from those levels that we saw in the past, the work that's going on there was to over, save over 20 lives killed. right now there is was something that deserves the backing There was the over 20 people shot last week. Five people shot over the weekend. Then why so, would we elect so, leaders on, who won't do anything let, about let, gun let, violence? Let me, well, it's the Democrats that run the city. Name the Republican whoa, 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 that is in charge. Whoa, whoa, right, but this is really important, no, right? No, tell me. I one, tell one Republican in charge of Chicago. Well, hold on. Name them. L listen to me, because not only did we have uh, those levels of crime under Democratic and Republican leaders, okay. right? But if you'll try to cherry pick this for partisan purposes, you want to play that game? It's not partisan. We can talk about as I how. Told you, Mr. Mayor, let's talk, they look like let's me, talk, not you. Yeah, and, not... So, and, and so is the case in Boston, where there is a much lower murder rate, uh, and also a Democratic mayor. We can talk about how the murder rate in Mississippi is double what it is in Illinois. Now, so listen, he's doing the best he can. Uh, Lawrence Jones has the louder mic, but. Pete Buttigieg is really good at this, and we could even analyze how if in setting up his answer, he first introduces a kind of personal story about his experience as mayor. He then talks about the stories that are sort of alternates to the story Lawrence Jones is telling. He then connects it to policy and then finally goes to the hypocrisy of the people that are pointing this this out often elect the leaders who don't actually want to deal with it. So really nicely done. He's very good at this, and I would not be surprised to see him uh, in even higher positions uh, uh, in the future, uh, to put it lightly, if not potentially running for president once again. If you want to see an example of a total lack of charisma and personality, I am going to show you one. Now, this might be difficult to watch. If you have an aversion to cringe, I recommend you don't watch these clips of J.D. Vance in Kenosha, Wisconsin this week. He sort of tries jokes and it really doesn't go well because he is so painfully uncharismatic. A reporter asked J.D. Vance, how are you preparing to debate Tim Walls? Here's what he said. Back to my question. So Donald Trump has enlisted the help of Tulsi Gabbard to prep for his debate. I'd like to know how you were prepping for a debate with Tim Walls, who has described himself as a bad debater. Who's helping you and how are you prepping? Well, I found a good friend from back home who embellishes and lies a lot. And I'm having him stand in for Tim Walls. That's what we're doing during our debate. You know, um, putting aside for a second that J.D. and Trump have been two of the biggest liars we've seen uh, as candidates to major elected office. It's really funny to hear him say he has friends. <laughs> uh, I know he used to, but we know a lot of his friends have completely abandoned him now that he has uh, become a doormat for Donald Trump. He just can't deliver any line, any line, no matter how simple in a remotely charismatic way. And this is why he is the least popular vice presidential running mate in, in modern American history. For as long as we've had polling, 
this is the, the least popular any vice presidential running mate has been. He was asked about Sean Fain's speech at the DNC, Sean Fain from the United Auto Workers. And um, he uh, had the following to say about that. Look, I think that my message to Sean Fain and any other leader of this of the labor movement would be who is the campaign? Wh which campaign is actually going to protect the jobs of American workers, union and non union alike? It's the campaign of Donald J. Trump. So sign up, get involved and support the candidates. that's actually going to protect your jobs now. So that's just a lie. How can anyone listen to the things Trump says about unions and organized labor and the things Joe Biden says and has done with regard to unions and organized labor, only president ever to join a picket line. And then you go back to Donald Trump's spaces thing with Elon Musk, where they both kind of together laughed and joked about how great it was that when workers decided to strike, uh, Elon Musk's workers decided to strike. Elon Musk just was like, oh, OK, you're fired. And Trump laughed about that and talked about how great and tough it was. So this is the line that we're talking about. And this is why J.D. Vance is so unpopular, which is he lies constantly, but uncharismatically and in a way that is completely not believable to anyone. So I don't think that J.D. is going to be fired by Trump. I think Trump recognizes the chaos and, and the absurdity of what that would suggest about Trump's own hiring abilities. But this is about as bad as you can be doing as a VP running mate. The rule is pick someone who won't get in your way and won't attract negative attention. If they can do anything positive for you, fine, but you they can't hurt you. And J.D. is really hurting Donald Trump. On the other hand, apply the same test to Tim Walls. Pick someone who's definitely not going to hurt you, won't get in the way. And Tim Walls has been such a boost to Kamala Harris. And uh, it, it you just couldn't see a more different picture of hiring decisions, despite the fact that Donald Trump has argued for decades that one of his great strengths is hiring the best people. You be the judge at the end of the day. I think voters will judge it in November. If you value what we do at the David Pakman show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman show where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. I want to look at a recent one of these J.D. Vance campaign events gone wrong, not only to talk a little bit about minimum wage and different codes that are used for saying I don't care about the minimum wage, I don't even want a minimum wage. But there's a bigger point that I think is important to illustrate here, which is that there's a sort of underpinning of criticism of the left by the Republican Party that's premised on Democrats, the left. They always want to go further and further with everything, and they apply this to so many different things. You want a fifteen dollar minimum wage? Well, next is a hundred and then two hundred and then three hundred. And of course, it's never true. And people like me who try to think through these problems empirically would say, well, hold on a second. We can make uh, an inflation adjusted and a productivity adjusted and a cost of living adjusted argument for the minimum wage being between 15 and 22 bucks an hour. I can make no serious argument for the minimum wage being two hundred dollars an hour. So you're wrong. The fact that we think the minimum wage should be higher right now doesn't mean that we just think should be higher. It should be higher indefinitely with no connection to the to the economy. But they love to say Democrats are always going to take everything too far. What I want you to consider as you hear J.D. Vance here asked, what do you think the minimum wage should be and not give an answer and actually use code for? I don't even know if we should have a minimum wage is that this is not about do we want to go further everything with everything by electing Kamala Harris versus keeping things the same with Donald Trump. It's actually worse than that. It's do you want to preserve the things we even have now with Kamala Harris or do we want to let Republicans take us back the way that they sort of have when it comes to Roe v. Wade. So here's J.D. Vance in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, asked, what is the position on what the minimum wage should be of Trump Vance? He doesn't answer it, but here's what he does say. John Cole, Pennsylvania Capital Star based in Philadelphia. As you talk about the economy, what does the Trump Vance ticket believe the federal minimum wage should be if Trump gets a second term? 
would he uh, support raising or should it stay the same? And is there a specific number that he well, would support it at? Well, look, Pre President Trump believes very strongly that the best way to promote raising Americans' wages is with tight labor markets. When, a, when an employer has got to pay a good wage to attract the right people, and you know the way that you destroy, whether you have a higher minimum wage or a lower minimum wage, the way to destroy the wages of American workers is to import 20 million illegal aliens and let them stay here with work visas. Okay, so he goes totally off track in order to hide the fact that he's alluding to no minimum wage. He goes off into fantasy land about importing illegal aliens, I think he said, in order to take jobs, all premised on false notions. But let me explain to you that code about how he likes tight labor markets. A tight labor market means there are more job openings than available workers, which leads employers to compete for workers by offering higher wages or better benefits or better working conditions. And what he's alluding to, there's an implied opposition to the minimum wage there, which is instead of setting what they call an artificial price floor, we will deal with the issue of what people should be paid by letting market forces dictate that. And the way you do that is you have more job openings than we do uh, people looking for work. And it's I mean, listen, it's, to call it legitimate or, 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 or illegitimate is sort of passing value judgment on it. And I do have judgment about it, but it's kind of like libertarian market oriented economics in a sense. And it's perfectly reasonable in a way to say, well, we shouldn't artificially be setting some irrational price floor for labor, two hundred dollars an hour, which no one is suggesting. What we have to recognize is that it is not a perfectly efficient market and we have very disproportionate market power when you consider employers as well as employees. And even in a situation where you would think the employees would have all of the bargaining power because there are uh, more jobs available than employees so they can go and demand whatever. That's only if they're on an even playing field and the employees aren't together and Republicans oppose unionization and collective bargaining in many ways. So it's funny that J.D. Vance says, well, we, we just we just let the market do it with a tight labor market, let the employees negotiate and so on and so forth, except you make them negotiate as individuals against a corporation with H.R. and multiple layers of management that's designed even in a tight labor market to get what's better for them rather than employees. So it's just a reminder of how if it were up to J.D. Vance, there might be no minimum wage whatsoever. But more importantly, it's all based on pretty shaky economics. Now, one other uh, clip from this. Do you support a national abortion ban? He also doesn't answer that. So he's just not answering any questions at these events. Senator Vance, what's your message to Pennsylvania voters on abortion? Has your opinion changed? Do you think there should be a national ban well, or should it be left up to the states? By the way, booing it as if it's an illegitimate question when he and Trump have flip flopped on this issue so many times shows you how successful these people have been at weaponizing their followers against the corporate media. Look, my my it's OK. It's all right. It's all right. Look, first of all, first of all, I, I think it's important to, 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 to be honest about what Donald Trump and I are focused on here. Okay. And what Donald Trump and I are focused on is making the American dream affordable again for Pennsylvania families. <laughs> that is what what I'm hearing there is what should the minimum wage be? I don't really know if we need a minimum wage. Will you uh, support a national abortion ban? I certainly won't rule it out. And for the the campaign that's been going around for nearly a month now saying Kamala Harris won't answer questions or she won't answer questions directly or at all. He's not answering any questions. So it's really important. There's a two layer. You know, we want to try to go as deep as we can with this stuff into the meaning of it all. And so when they don't answer questions, but accuse others of not answering questions, we have to call that out. But we also need to explain the substance or meaning of the questions they aren't answering. And in this particular case, when it comes to a national abortion ban and the minimum wage, it's all very, very ugly. I want to, as we continue talking about failed talking points that don't even pass the sniff test yet are repeated and amplified by the American right wing, I want to look at one that's been floating around for a while. 
And as we now get into the discussions about, oh, are they going to steal the election? Will Trump have to figure the, the, the normal stuff that the MAGA right wing is doing? Donald Trump Jr. unveils or repeats this totally debunked talking point that Democrats are bringing in undocumented immigrants so that they will vote for them in order for them to win. Now, you may already know why that makes no sense. But we're going to talk about it. But here's Don's idea. They, can do it. they can't legally do it, but they check a box and they say they think they're fine to vote as long as they think they're OK. It's not really illegal. No one's going to enforce it. They want to make sure they neuter anyone who would actually check those voter rolls or confirm those citizenships. So, you know, they're not allowed to do it, but they will. They can do it. OK. It is obviously untrue and would be a very stupid way to try to steal an election. And it also couldn't possibly work. So let's talk this one through <clears throat> because they repeat it very often. First of all, undocumented migrants are not legally allowed to vote in the United States. Don acknowledges that, but there's meaning to it. It's not just well, lots of people do things that are against the law. That's why we have criminal law. OK, the fact that undocumented migrants aren't allowed to vote in the United States in federal or state elections is relevant because they aren't even able to register. You can't register if you're not a citizen. Now, there are exceptions in certain municipalities where any resident can vote without. But that doesn't apply to state and federal elections. OK, so even trying to register is already against the law and it's very easily detected because you try to register. You're, you're not a citizen that's documented. It doesn't go anywhere. Citizenship is a requirement to register. Election officials regularly update and monitor voter rolls. There's really no way to add ineligible voters to the voter rolls. So when they talk about Democrats bringing in undocumented immigrants to vote, since they can't register, it's all crazy. But let's assume what they mean is the undocumented immigrants don't go and register. They just show up and go, hey, I'm a Sean Smith and I'm here to vote. So the idea would be you coordinate. You have to, I guess, figure out, you know, we have a 50 to 60 percent voter turnout rate in presidential elections. So you'd have to figure out who are the 40 percent not likely to show up and vote. And we have to go and make sure we give those names. Right. If Sally Sally Q public plans to vote, it's even riskier to show up and go, I'm Sally, because then it might show up. Sally's already voted. Something weird is going on here. So what you would have to do is figure out who's not likely to vote, show up, say that you're them only in places where I guess you don't need an ID. And also you're doing it one vote at a time. It's a very stupid way to try to win an election. And even if a small number of undocumented undocumented immigrants were able to pull this off, they figured out who are the citizens unlikely to vote. We're going to show up at polling places. We're going to say that we are them. We are going to vote illegally. It's not going to swing an election. The logistical challenges, never mind the risks, make it a painfully stupid way to try to steal an election. Now, when you confront them with this, they will often retreat to something else like, well, the voting machines and something. Well, if you're just going to hack the voting machines, you don't need to find Latin American undocumented migrants to go and show up and vote one by one, figuring out where it is likely that they could get away with it. So the entire thing falls apart upon any examination. But this here that you're looking at is not the face of a guy doing any critical examination. Let's leave it there. Please make sure that you have pre ordered my forthcoming book, The Echo Machine. Very, very, very important thing. You can find it at davidpackman.com slash echo or anywhere that physical books, ebooks, and audio books are sold. Follow us on social media, interact with the David Pakman Show community, see exclusive content, see when we're taking calls live and stay up to date on other big show announcements. We post daily. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord and TikTok. All right, let's get into Friday feedback. It is Friday. It's time for feedback. You can email info at davidpakman.com. You can respond to a YouTube comment, sometimes a TikTok. You Twitter, probably not. I don't think we're paying much attention to Twitter, but all sorts of your comments could end up on Friday feedback. We start, though, with something a little different. We ran a poll 
on the community tab for the YouTube channel. We just asked, hey, what do you think of the selection that Kamala Harris made for her running mate running mate of Tim Walls? What just what do you think? What's your opinion? Two hundred and ten thousand of you voted. That is not a not a joke, folks, not a joke with two hundred and ten thousand of you voting. Ninety one percent said that Tim Walls is an outstanding choice to be VP, while nine percent of you wanted someone different, uh, even after the selection of Walls. These are stunning numbers, stunning numbers, and certainly reinforce the idea that while on the one hand, J.D. Vance seems like a drag on Trump, he's just like he's a little gnat that just won't stop causing problems for him that Trump can't seem to swat away. Uh, and on the other hand, Tim Walls has turned out to be an extraordinary asset for Kamala Harris. The DNC certainly proved that again. Uh, the Trump uh, 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 rallies in contrast to Tim Walls's performance in rallies certainly uh, reminds us of that. So remarkable. Ninety one percent of the more than two hundred thousand of you that voted say, yeah, Tim Walls. Very, very good idea. Here's an interesting little bit of feedback from Mark on YouTube. Mark 73 says it is mind boggling that Trump is polling as high as he is in a sane country. He would be in the single digits across the board. Yeah. You know, I I recently did a, a podcast appearance where I was asked, how is it? How is it that despite all the things Trump has done and said, he still has support in the United States? And I explained, well, you have to understand a couple of things. You have to understand that the hardcore MAGA supporters are like cult members. It's not any different than the people that follow Charles Manson or Jim Jones or David Koresh and the Branch Davidians or any of these. That's number one. And number two, they make up a significant portion of the Republican Party. I don't remember exactly the split in terms of the Republican primary, but let's assume like 75 percent of the votes were for Trump and 25 weren't. My guess is, you know, primary voters are probably a little more likely to represent uh, to overrepresent Trump supporters. So if we say, well, maybe not 75 percent of the Republican Party, but 65 is probably pretty hardcore Trumpists at this point. It doesn't matter what he does. And it's an extraordinarily sad commentary. But in a sane country, Trump would be polling in a sane country. Trump wouldn't even poll 10 percent. He'd poll 3 percent as a goof because of his celebrity. And that'd be it. And we'd never hear from the guy again on the topic of Trump increasingly panicking. This triggered a lot of the maggots and the Magadonians and even the Magapotamians, I would say. JSPNJ said he's not panicking, you dumb F. Kamala is terrified to debate him and she knows it even if you deny it. You know, if Kamala is the one who's terrified to debate, why did she say? I'll do as many debates as he wants and I'll do wherever he wants them. Uh, I'll do them wherever he wants to do them. And it's been Trump who's been hemming and hawing about why would I debate at all? I'll do it only on Fox News. They aren't acting like people where Kamala is afraid and Trump is not. Uh, this individual continues and says David Pakman fails again. Trump could say out loud that he won't tolerate schools teaching perversion to kids. And David would make a half hour video saying Trump is in the wrong. Very much not. When Trump has gotten it right, I've uh, said he's gotten it right. When Trump wanted to decrease the threshold in his tax plan for the deductibility of uh, medical expenses, I said he's right to do it. That's correct. I don't care who's doing it. He then ended up canceling it. <laughs> but uh, no, it was completely uh, what if he does something I support, then I will tell you he just doesn't do that much that I support. A uh, duck reach on YouTube weighing in about how the right is framing Kamala Harris and Tim Walls and says it's hilarious watching them trying to paint a former prosecutor and a moderate governor as, quote, radical left. Imagine an ad with a picture of Harris Walls on one side and the QAnon shaman on the other captioned. Guess which one the Trump campaign sees as extremist. Yeah, they 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 never say that the QAnon shaman is extreme in his beliefs. But Harris Walls are supposedly Marxist, communist, anarchists, as Trump pronounces it. Uh, this is a remind. This is a very important reminder of how effectively they've moved the Overton window because they've shifted the political dialogue, even though the country has moved to the left over the last 10 years, 
even though polling has moved to the left, we still are overwhelmingly represented by disproportionately right wing elected officials. And yes, the Republican Party is at a point where the extremist is Kamala Harris, who is way to the right, by the way, of where far leftists are in the United States. It's truly incoherent, but there is a knowable reality here. We don't have to endlessly stumble about wondering is Kamala Harris left or right wing. Kamala Harris is on the political left more or less in the kind of framework of Joe Biden. Biden's presidency has been to the left of Barack Obama's and all of it is probably to the right of Bernie Sanders. And all of that, all of that is still to the right of what we would call true far leftism, which there isn't much of in the United States. It's not very popular. And and uh, that's sort of where they are on the political spectrum. Um, it's not difficult to ascertain if you just devote a little bit of time to thinking it through. Joe M. W. weighed in on J.D. Vance wearing makeup and says, I don't care about the eyeliner. I do care about the hypocrisy of a guy wearing eyeliner lecturing me about gender roles. Beautifully said. This is, you know, I I spoke last week or the week before about it. I noticed that J.D. Vance wears eye makeup traditionally reserved for stage performers and women culturally, whether you call it women's makeup or not. I don't care. He wears makeup. OK, I noticed it a while ago. It didn't really seem fair game for discussion until now. J.D. Vance is not only making all sorts of statements, normative statements about gender roles, biological versus step parents, pre versus post menopausal women, what women are supposed to be doing with regard to reproduction, talking about abortion or more recently straight up not answering questions about abortion. He is imposing extraordinarily aggressive and normative views on gender roles while there are numerous pictures of him in drag. I think that's still the correct term. You know, I never want to use an offensive. I believe that's still the correct term with dressed in drag regularly wears eyeliner, maybe mascara, maybe even eyeshadow. I'm not uh, well versed on makeup, so I'm not totally sure, but he's got a lot going on there. It's not about the makeup. It's about the double standards and the hypocrisy. And he has whether or not he wears makeup. Listen, put lipstick on him. I don't care. Uh, he is the last person who should be lecturing anybody about gender roles. That's for damn sure. Uh, here's a, a message not exactly of peace and love. D and, and there will be some language here because remember, we're not on radio and TV anymore, so it's all fair game. David, I can't believe to explain. I can't. Sorry, let me start over. <laughs> David, I can't begin to explain how much I hate you in your videos. You're a shitty wannabe news anchor that will never make it in the big world because your conversation topic are horrible. You lie, lie, lie to your own audience and you don't even try to hide it. You make bogus claims and condescending tones to market to your 16 year old audience. And the way you look and speak irk me in a way I can't explain. Love you, shitbag. OK, so this whole wannabe news anchor and I'm never going to make it. I know that a lot of people on the right don't like to accept this. And I, I'm trying to say this in the most accurate way. We're in the top point one percent of YouTube. It's over like we've made it. We, we won the game. OK, if I quit tomorrow and that's it, we made it into the top zero point one percent on YouTube. This program supports a team of staff members full time as well as a bunch of part timers and, and consultants and contractors of different different service providers of different kinds. We've done it. OK, you know, you look on YouTube for left wing. It's the Young Turks, Brian Tyler Cohen, Midas Touch, David Pakman show. So the people saying you'll never make it, we've made it and it's kind of over. Now, as far as my 16 year old audience, interestingly, the audience is, is older than you might think. Yes, on TikTok, the audience skews younger. But as far as YouTube, we've got a relatively middle aged audience and uh, there's nothing particularly uh, shocking or surprising about it. So anyway, someone who gets everything wrong, everything wrong in their desperate attempts, desperate attempts to uh, attack me personally. And one other such example who said, dude, you were the reason our country is going to shit. 
you fucking libtards need to move to Venezuela so you can live in what you call democracy. Hashtag Trump 2024. I'm going to say this very carefully and very slowly for the millionth time. I'm not a socialist. I oppose the Venezuelan regime, formerly of Hugo Chavez and now of Nicolas Maduro. I believe that that is the way for states to fail. And I am a social Democrat, which is a regulated form of capitalism. One of the last places I would ever move is Venezuela. You might have me confused with Trump, who recently said he might flee to Venezuela if he loses. All right. One more negative message and then we'll get to something positive. Richard says it is truly is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I messed it up again. Here we go. It tr I, I'm glitching like Trump. Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat. Uh... Yeah. OK. It truly is amazing how the folks who follow you, David, actually believe all the crap that you and the left media throw out there. You keep overlooking the obvious lies that are thrown out there to promote the make believe world of Biden Harris administration. Aside from your constant hate filled attack on Trump, what is it that you prefer and like about the Harris Biden way of doing things? This site does not let me see anything you respond to me. So if any of you care to tell me what a good thing is you like about the current folks in office, send it to me in a message to my address. Yes, I'm going to send you snail mail, Richard, with my opinion. I have uh, laid this out many times. The um, great for the rich economic approach of Trump crony politics is uh, crony capitalism is not for me. The more uh, social safety net approach with a positive vision for what people can do when they are guaranteed some minimum standard of living that is espoused by Harris Walls resonates more with me on reproductive freedom. I am all in with Harris Walls and not with Trump, who cheers about his justices uh, rejecting and overturning Roe v. Wade. When it comes to foreign policy and respect for institutions, I prefer the approach of Harris and of Walls, which is we work with our historical allies. We stick to our commitments made on the world stage. We don't just bail on them the way Trump does. When it comes to immigration, I recognize that, yes, we have a border and the border should be enforced. And also we've got to focus on why people are trying to come here to begin with. We've got to figure out what to do in terms of a path to citizenship for those who were brought here as minors. I could go on and on, but on just about every issue, on just about every issue, I come down on the Biden Harris side or the Harris Wall side. And I don't know how else to say it. Finally, Gator Sean from the subreddit says, I think I understand the Trump press conferences now. Sometimes when I'm stressed, I get in the car and drive around a little and just talk to myself out loud. That's what his press events seem like today. They are just him venting out loud to himself. Yeah, I've called them verbal ink blots. Uh, that's really all it is. Um, Trump's ability to speak, to take words and put them in an order and in a syntax that we can understand them has been greatly diminished over the last many years. And at this point, Trump's events are I, I would basically say they are free, uh, free word association sort of events. Corporate media is noticing even Trump supporters are noticing who look around a little bit confused when it happens. Sad, but hopefully we can prevent it from becoming something that emanates from the Oval Office in the future. Uh, get your messages in info at David dot com. Remember to pre order my forthcoming book, The Echo Machine at David dot com slash echo many goodies forthcoming for those who pre order. And of course, remember that you can sign up at joinpacman.com, become a member today, super easy, and you'll get the daily bonus show as well as so many other great perks. There has never been a more important time to support the work we do. We will see you on the bonus show and back here on Monday.